Welcome to Beyond Politics on WKXLAM and FM and now at 101.9 broadcast in Manchester, New Hampshire, where podcasts wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're listening by podcast, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Hodes, with my co-host, Matt Robeson. In the summer of 2014, Washington Post Tehran correspondent Jason Rezaian and his wife were arrested and held essentially as hostages in order for the Iranian government to be able to exert leverage in its negotiations with the United States and what eventually became the Iranian nuclear deal. Ultimately held for 544 days, 100 days longer than the US hostages seized in 1979. Jason has since continued his reporting and analysis on similar cases, including in his book, Prisoner, My 544 Days in an Iranian Prison, Solitary Confinement, a Sham Trial, High Stakes Diplomacy, and the Extraordinary Efforts It Took to Get Me Out. Recently, Jason teamed with producer Kate Woodson to create the very powerful short documentary film, Bring Them Home, about the family of American citizen Imad Shargi, who is currently held hostage in Iran. Jason and Kate, uh, we want to welcome you. It's an honor to have you on Beyond Politics to talk. Thank you. Thank you for having, Thanks for having us. Sure. So let me just jump right in. I, I'm, I'm curious about the decision uh, that you both made to make about this film. Um, and Kate, I'm going to ask you when I'm finished with my question to, to go first and then turn it over to Jason. But Jason, as you mentioned in your recent interview on the Post Reports podcast regarding the jailing of uh, Brett basketball star Brittany Griner in Russia last week, the decision to raise the profile of a case like this and for the family to go public in this way can be very difficult. There's a, a brand new um, article in the New York Times about the various factors and strains that go into a decision to go public. It's often feared that it might create more dangers for the person who is held overseas. Um, going back to the case of Imad Shargi, how, how did the Shargi family reach this, the decision to go public? And uh, why did you uh, think this film was a good way to do it? Kate? Well, as you can see in the film, Bring Them Home, um, Bahari Shargi, Imad's wife, describes that she was told by Iranian officials to keep silent, to not tell anyone. And um, she thought that if she stayed silent, this mix up would be cleared, clarified, Imad would be freed. And in fact, as so often happens with the um, opaque you know, Iranian judicial system, Ahmad was released from Evan prison on house arrest. And, um, and so Bahare thought, okay, well, silence worked in this case. Um, soon he'll be coming to the United States. But um, Imad was rearrested on bogus made up charges. And Bahare realized that um, complying, silence is essentially complicity with the Iranian government's um, machinations. And so, when, oh, when President Biden came to office, the Shargis made the decision that they needed help from the United States government. And so they first went to essentially the State Department and said, um, my husband is American citizen. He's being held against his will. We need your help. Um, that is terrifying, right? Because Iran has told them to stay silent. We now have a family that feels responsible for the health and safety of someone in a prison in um, a foreign country that we know has a long history of um, abuses. So that was terrifying in itself to alert the United States government. Then to go to the press, in a way, it's both an act of desperation and an act of total courage. Um, the only thing that they had in their power and in their control that they could do to help Ahmad 
was to try to make people care about him, to try to make U.S. officials care about him, and to try to make the public care about him. Um, and so they initially came to us to place an op-ed in the Washington Post. Um, Hannah and Ariana Shargi had written a piece about their dad, and um, we decided it would be good to interview them on camera because so often in order for people to connect to something, you need to see them and hear them. Um, and so Jason, because he covers this, because he had his own experience with this, um, is, a, is a known trusted entity among this, um, what he'll say is a sadly growing club of former hostages or families with loved ones who are detained wrongfully. Um, so he gave, he gave me essentially um, his approval um, to the family. And so we started talking with the family. Um, and as I got to know them, I realized number one, they have such a gripping, important story, but they're also incredible people. Bahre and her daughters are um, so loving and it's a, and, and hopeful in the darkest moments. And it is a love that was in, is infused in their family, you know, built by Imad and Bahari. So um, I decided to do the short doc and it, other reporting that I've done on, on hostages and their families, because I think so often foreign policy feels like a far away um, thing that you can't touch and that doesn't affect you. And even domestic policy so often is um, chalked up to something that we don't have power over or that might not affect us. And it's easy to ignore or click through headlines. It's much harder to ignore the tears or you know the, the um, rage, grief, confusion of someone that you're seeing on screen. And so um, with my privilege and platform of the Washington Post, I think it's important to show how power and policy affects people. Um, and this is one of those situations where um, we will continue to, to have this merry-go-round um, between the US and Iran um, and relations that have been strained for 40 years until people start to realize, you know, the formula isn't working. Um, and also to understand that this is a growing problem. And, and the only way you can really feel it is to, to step inside the life of the family. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about the decision to, to make this film a family story. And I think you addressed that very well. It, it seems like a very conscious decision. In fact, let's check out a quick clip from the trailer right now. I'm writing a letter from my sister and I, President Biden, explaining our situation, our dad's situation. These two young ladies at this age who are, should be worried about going out, partying, having fun. And then here they pouring their being into this letter, into every meeting we have with the lawyers, with the State Department. They say they want to do anything they can to help, and they are doing every single thing they can in their power to help their father. And that that kind of leads me to another question, because you're both experienced in reporting on situations like this, as you alluded to, Kate. And I was wondering if you could take our, our listeners and our viewers who are watching this on, on video inside that process of reporting on cases of Americans' health, particularly in Iran. Are there things that you hold back in reporting about or that you consult carefully with U.S. government personnel about in order to avoid making matters worse? Is there an internal editorial strategy going on at a high profile paper like the Post to, to try to walk through uh, how you're going to handle this, how you're going to handle the reporting, how you're going to depict the story so that you, you walk that fine line of reporting for your readers, but also the, the kind of the delicate underlying negotiations that are taking place. I, I mean, Kate, if you want to start with that. Yeah, Jason and I um, have walked this path together, but we also have unique um, challenges that we've confronted. Um, my personal policy um, in reporting is to do no harm. 
And um, when you're, I am working with a family, whether it is the Shargis or someone else who is living um, and experiencing active trauma, um, my first priority is to make sure to not worsen that trauma. Um, and it's inevitable, you know, sharing one of the hardest things in your life is going to be um, traumatizing. But so all of the decisions we made um, in terms of when to release the film, um, how to do the other recording that we did. I wrote several pieces. Jason, of course, has written many. Um, I did what is not typical. Journalists don't show their sources, um, their films or their stories. But I went through a process of um, showing the Shargis um, a, a rough cut of the film to um, make sure that they were comfortable with um, the usage of Imad's voice or not on phone calls from prison. There were certain things that they were concerned would be taken out of context by the Iranian government that could potentially be used against Imad, not because there is any um, credible um, thing there that is could be held against him, but because Iran does this. So um, I made sure to do that. And then I also actually worked with the Washington Post lawyers and had them look at it um, because the Washington Post lawyers were critical in um, the effort to secure Jason's freedom. And having had been through that rigmarole, um, they know um, what is potentially dangerous. And so that was a, a unique process um, that isn't applied equally to all subjects, but it was something that I did here. Um, and in terms of what to report from the government or not, um, you know, like all reporting, there are some things that you get off the record or on background that enables you to better understand a situation um, or, you know, continue to have conversations with certain officials. And um, we applied the standard, I applied the standards of, um, of, of regular reporting there. Um, but Jason can talk more about that. He's, he's in much more frequent conversation with government officials than I am. Yes, please, Jason, what's your perspective? Look, I mean, I, I think I have a, um, a kind of a unique uh, three-pronged approach to um, these situations. And um, Kate and I have, have worked on several of these stories going back a few years. And one of the really wonderful things about working with her is that we share that do no harm um, policy. Um, and, you know, we've, we've worked mostly together on hostage cases, but other cases as well, where, you know, there are sensitivities that um, not everybody is going to take into account when, when reporting on them. So, you know, for me, these projects, and this one in particular, starts with a lot of conversations with, with the family. First of all, uh, to figure out where their head's at, um, what their concerns are, give them some hope that the ordeal... Um, can and will probably end. Um, in some cases, you know, I, I really didn't push the the, the Shargis very hard uh, to, to kind of go public, but, you know, I try and offer people a vision of what it's like from that person sitting in the prison cell, right? And uh, my experience, personal experience and experience of other cases that I've reported on is that, um, your treatment gets better the more your situation is known uh, in the world. And so, you know, I'm coming at it from a place where I haven't had a single person, whether it was an Iran case, uh, Russia case, or any other country, uh, when they got released, come to me say, you know, Jason, I, I wish you hadn't have written about me. It's never happened once. So, you know, until that happens, I'm going to be the person that says, let's be as vociferous about this as possible. Um, Second, you know, in, in terms of communicating with, with people in, in government, um, again, I'm in a unique situation because a lot of the people who are in the Biden administration who are in these roles are people who worked on my case. So there is a rapport there. And as Kate alluded to, some of the things that they, that they tell us are not reportable 
um, but they help us form a larger picture of what it is that 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 we're going to do. And I, I can say that in, in in one instance, not too long ago, before Bring Them Home came out, I just wanted to make sure that publishing this film wasn't going to break any eggs in the process for you know things that might have been going on. And an official came back to me, someone who I who I know and who trusts me, and said, "You guys are not going to screw anything up. Don't you know? Like, don't." it's not your fault that this, this is happening and there's nothing that you can do to make it worse or even better. Right. And so that's, that, that's something that we take into account. And then lastly, you know, Kate and I work on, on the opinion side of the Washington post, but the news side also has um, um, kind of policies that they put in place. A lot of them following the, the coverage of my case and the family has to be the first line of communication. Washington Post is not going to report on a hostage case until a family verbally says to a reporter, this is, you know, I want this information out in the world. So that's the policy that I've taken over with me to opinions personally that Kate and I employ in in the work that that we've done on this together and and individually. Um, But, you know, I don't want to say that I'm cavalier or confident about, you know, this approach because every case is unique and every situation is different, but we have some guiding principles that um, I think lead how we go about uh, addressing one of these. And until proven otherwise, I'm a firm believer that, um, that not only does democracy die in darkness, hostages um, do as well. Um, I, I want to f- follow up on something <clears throat> Kate, Kate said a while ago in talking about uh, the film, uh, Bring Them Home, um, and talking about it as, as a family story. Um, I mean, the new film, and I'm interested in your thoughts on the audience for the film and how that affects whether or not or what kind of family story you tell. Because uh, the new film, Bring Them Home, shares some similarities with some other short films. Um, The Guardian uh, told Jason's story in a very personal way and interviewed his mother, his mother, Mary. Um, And in thinking about what Jason just said about reaching out to the government and and thinking about, Kate, what you said earlier about wanting to sort of broaden the audience. In making the film, how do you decide who's your primary audience? And does that affect uh, the way you uh, think about creating the film? I.e., if you are more concerned about um, uh, the, the 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 government internally responding to you, would it, would you have made the film in a different way than if you were concerned about reaching a broader audience in a sympath to to create uh, education, knowledge, and sympathy? Um, uh, and as you said, there's nothing like tears. Um, how do you make those decisions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... What is the answer? Um, So when I think about story, I don't think first of audience. Um, And some would say that's not, you know, particularly at a newspaper where you're trying to get people to click on something, you should be thinking of audience first. Who is this catering to? But I think about um, the story, the issue, um, and the protagonist, essentially. Um, And some people call them the subject or the character. Um, I think of the person affected by a policy. Um, And because my intent is to educate, um, because my intent is to help people think of humans rather than just politicians or policies, I choose my subjects based on um, their story and their ability to tell their story. You know, there are many people who um, have this story. Not all of them are as able to articulate it or as comfortable with us 
um, to be as vulnerable as as Bahari is on camera. You know, she is crying um, very um, without guard on camera, and it's because of the relationship we built. So filmmaking or doc, doc filmmaking in a way is almost like investigative journalism in how important it is to nurture a relationship with your sources. Um, because this is a long, long-term relationship with many highs and lows, you're not gonna be able to turn the story quickly. And um, if there isn't trust in the process and um, you might lose access um, and so in choosing who I tell stories about, it's as important to me that they feel my integrity and that they know my integrity as I know theirs, if that makes sense. Mm, that um, sense. Jason and I collaborated on a short about um, the travel ban um, that former President Trump imposed against um, individuals from majority Muslim countries. And there was so much focus on the, the countries. Um, and there is a way that the media um, joins in the othering of people. Um, and so what, in thinking through how do we tell the, the impact of this travel ban, we did think of the audience on that one. And we thought, you know what, white Americans um, need to know that it's not just these other people, these foreigners, these, um, you know, and so we chose to tell the story about two um, white Americans, each of whom are, were married to Iranians and they, their love um, and their relationships were divided, torn apart by this travel ban. Mm -hmm. We chose that approach to, make it impossible for the audience to other them because our, our, our protagonists are just like them. Sure. Um, these choices are why I'm in the opinion section as opposed to news. Um, our reporting is incredibly rigorous, but I'm able to choose a subject and say, I think that this um, needs more scrutiny and I'd like to tell it from the perspective of somebody negatively affected by it, for example. I wanted to ask both of you about an article that you collaborated on back in 2019 called Iran's Hostage Factory about the case of recently released British national Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. Uh, you said, and I'm quoting, the Islamic Republic has honed state-sponsored hostage taking into a, a key foreign policy weapon with business people, tourists, journalists, academics, information technology specialists, even travel vloggers among those who have been swept up in this phenomenon. At that time, there were 13 known cases of people held in Iran. What is driving Iran to do this? How pervasive is the problem now, two and a half years later? And is there any sign that this will let up? Jason, maybe we can turn to you. Sure. Um, the short answer is there's no sign that it's going to let up. Uh, and that is because um, the answer to your other question, why are they doing it? It's working. Um, it gets results for them. Now, I would argue that uh, if you go back and look at the 43-year history of the Islamic Republic, um, we all know that the, the taking of diplomats at the embassy was one of sort of the, the, the founding acts of the Islamic Republic and the defining moment in that country's history. I would argue that the reputational damage that has been done to Iran by hostage taking uh, has probably cost them a lot more in revenue and foreign investment than they've achieved from uh, these individual cases. But they've made the, the calculation and the decision that taking hostages and then using them as leverage in their international negotiations with other countries um, has, uh, has, has been a rewarding experience for them. And there's no reason that they're going to stop because there aren't uh, effective... Uh, deterrence in place to slow it down. It was first uh, a problem of American citizens at the embassy, uh, but then dual nationals like myself. And over the last seven, eight years, it's become more prevalent that they've taken uh, nationals of other countries like the UK, Canada, um, 
all of the Western European nations. I mean, at this very moment, in the midst of very high level negotiations about whether or not uh, Iran and world powers are gonna re-enter into a nuclear agreement, there are citizens of the United States, France, Germany, and the UK, the, the four democratic nations who are party to this, uh, this deal, along with uh, two Austrian citizens, the country that's actually hosting the negotiations. I'm of the camp that says, to deter this, we have to come up with uh, credible means of showing Iran and other countries that, uh, that there's a cost that's higher than the benefit. But that cost can only be uh, exacted if countries like the US, Canada, UK, Germany, France, and all the others that I mentioned work together to say, hey, we're not gonna accept this anymore. And as happy as I am about the release of Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe and Anushe Ashuri, um, when we kind of dissect what happened in that deal, and that's still happening, um, this sort of proposed unified approach uh, that the US and the UK were pushing to try and release their hostages broke down. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, in that case, Iran kind of wins uh, this time. And um, I, I felt like there was a real opportunity for like-minded nations to, to stand together in the midst of this negotiation get all, everybody released at once and uh, and make a point of it, but that point is no longer available to be made. You, you also point out in that same 2019 article that until 2018, the cases of Americans held in Iran were handled by the section of the State Department that provides support for all U.S. citizens abroad but that the responsibility has been moved to the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs. So what's the impact of this change? I mean, in working with the Shargi family, are they experiencing a different kind of response from our government than previous families, including yours, Jason, might have experienced? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the difference is, is, is um, measurable, but not big enough, because institutionally, uh, the special envoy position has not um, kind of solidified uh, its role in, uh, in these cases to the extent that um, was mandated by the plan when Obama created the role back in 2015. Uh, the Levinson Act, a piece of legislation that went into effect a year ago, uh, named after Bob Levinson, a former FBI agent who was longest held hostage in American history in Iran, um, sort of codifies what uh, a wrongful detainee is. When we talk about a wrongful detainee, Kate and I report on those as state hostages. People are being, that are being held by foreign governments uh, for reasons of political leverage against the United States. Um, when that determination is made, the SPIHA, the, the hostage envoy office, is sort of called in uh, to help figure out how to bring these people home. But traditionally, the, the State Department uh, has gone to uh, the consular affairs uh, wing of, of, um, uh, of the agency to try and uh, settle these cases. Now, I, I completely and for the work of consular affairs. It's very important to hire lawyers for people in, in these countries that are being held. It's very important for them to have clean socks and books to read and make sure that they're getting medical, medical adequate medical care. Uh, but oftentimes that's not doing anything to get them out, right? And so this parallel office of, of the hostage envoy um, is really there to, to go and negotiate with bad actors. Um, and from what I've seen um, and the reporting that, that we've done on this, that office has been somewhat hamstrung in, in their ability to uh, intervene in these cases. In the situation with Iran, they're not even involved in these cases. Those are being handled by the, the envoy for Iranian affairs, not by the, by the hostage envoy. So I, I think as time goes on, as this problem gets worse, uh, the hostage envoy will be leaned on more um, but unfortunately, without those deterrent measures, as Kate and I have seen in our reporting, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. 
the number of Americans being held hostage by states has risen exponentially. It's in the 40s right now. That's not a massive number. But what happens when it's 200? What happens when it's 400? Is the State Department going to have the bandwidth, the resources, uh, or, or really uh, the energy to, to, to care for uh, these individual cases and bring these folks home? So, Kate, can you speak specifically about um, how that change affected the Shargi case? Um, yes. So first, I want to give a little background on uh, how that change came about. We, there was a string of beheadings and um, kidnappings, hostage taking in 2014, 2015 during the Obama administration. And the, the grotesque, horrifying nature of that, plus the media attention on it, um, compelled the Obama administration to essentially do an audit of the U.S.'s hostage recovery response. Um, and so from that, they realized, oh, not only do we need to do better, but there are different kinds of hostages being taken. And that led to um, what Jason talked about in terms of the definition of a wrongful detainee, a state hostage. Um, and then from that grew um, a, an FBI hostage fusion cell, the special um, presidential envoy for hostage affairs, which Jason described, a unit at the in the National Security Council. So um, all of these, like he said, are good steps, not good enough. Um, what the Shargis have benefited from that they have described to us is constant communication from the State Department, where in the past, um, the families of Americans wrongfully detained abroad would essentially be like, cold calling random numbers at the State Department, the White right. House, you right. know, like going through the halls, essentially saying like, can anybody help me where, you know, what am I supposed to do? There's no roadmap to this. Right. And um, also, I, I don't, you know, and also frozen, institutionally frozen out of the process, right. you know, not given access, communicating with families was not a priority. Yeah. And so, you know, you have one victim in a prison somewhere and then you have other victims, the families who are here completely in the dark. And um, the gift that is, you know, making this part of the government is that under uh, Roger Carstens, who's the current um, special envoy for hostage affairs, his team is totally dedicated to the family. At least that's that's what I understand um, that that families can talk to them. If there is an American that is taken hostage abroad, that office will deploy somebody to talk to that family pretty quickly. So you're already living a level of anxiety and um, lack of control. That communication has improved um, the, the experiences of many families. Um, that said, um, actually getting their loved one out of the country um, requires that office, the Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, to have the authority to negotiate with certain countries that the U.S. doesn't generally negotiate with. You know, they need to be empowered by the, the White House, by the president, to get the job done. Um, there are now eight Americans um, wrongfully detained, being held hostage by the Venezuelan government. Two of them mm -hmm. recently came home. Under the Trump administration, they severed ties with Venezuela, and so there were no talks between the two governments. And only in recent months has the U.S. Um, reinitiated conversations, particularly on the hostage issue. Um, well, you know, but, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, but it just that that doesn't happen unless um, the executive branch says do it. And um, we have all these groups dedicated to hostages, but there's no one person that is accountable. Um, and I spoke with um, Robert O'Brien of the Trump administration. He was the former hostage envoy and then became the national security advisor. And he himself said, you know, unless the president makes this a priority, it's not gonna get done. Um, and he was able to, to bring a bunch of Americans home because that was important to um, Trump for, you know, whatever you think of him, that was a priority. Hmm. Well, it, that's, this topic is exactly what I think we wanted to follow up about because 
We have heard separately uh, from our previous guest, Diane Foley, the mother of James Foley, who was um, killed in the course of reporting in Syria, about that change and the increased communication with families. It's something that she, she credited as well and, and does seem to have improved the experience of families like the Shargis. But on the other hand, one of the moments that really stood out to me as a former staffer, and I think to Paul as a former member of Congress, was uh, from your film, was the moment when Representative Ted Deutsch says that there are lots and lots of creative things that we could do in the case of Ahmad Shargi, because that wasn't our experience right. as, as a member of Congress and as a staffer kind of behind the scenes calling the State Department, you know, dealing with their representatives. When we were working on, uh, there's one notable case that comes to mind for me uh, of one of Paul's constituents, a, an American citizen, and we ran into a lot of limits on what the State Department could do and what we in a congressional office could do, which basically amounted to every day calling the State Department and saying, any news, any news, any anything you could do. So could you tell us a little bit more about what options truly exist, especially for, for members of Congress um, and for people trying to advocate within the system when they're caught in a nightmare? Are they still like this? Are, are they still as limited as it seemed to us? Jason? Sure. Um, there's still a lot of limitations, but, um, and I think we have to acknowledge uh, Diane Foley's pivotal role in turning this into um, a matter of uh, concern at the highest levels of government. No one has ever been as relentless an advocate for hostages as Diane Foley. Um, and, you know, there are a growing number of people uh, who have come home and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the internet age and our ability to kind of communicate and connect with each other, uh, that we're, we're building a sort of um, history uh, and, and picking it apart. The Foley Foundation um, keeps incredible uh, records on current cases, previous cases, uh, puts out a report every year on, on how the the, the, the US government response is to this. So I think, you know, compared to a decade ago, a family is in a much better situation than, than they were today. They are, they're in a much better situation today to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody um, and, and get a response and something, you know, moving rather quickly, but it's still far from, from good enough. Um, and I think, you know, on the congressional side, you know, part of what we're trying to do is, educate members of, of Congress uh, ab about this issue. You know, Congressman Deutsch, uh, you know, a lot of people who've seen the film have seized on that moment. And I have to say, you know, um, Congressman Deutsch said the, the quiet part out loud there, right? And, um, and I think that it's his, to his credit, you know, he's one of the, the, the members uh, of Congress that's been the best on the issue of hostage affairs. He and French Hill, uh, can created this bipartisan uh, hostage task force because they understand that this isn't a partisan issue. This is an American issue. And I think, um, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time with, with Roger Carston and his team. One of the things that I said to him at some point was, you know, um, State Department career uh, officers should all have to spend an hour in solitary confinement. One hour. Just put them in solitary for an hour so that they understand that, you know, if they are um, dealing with a constituent in their family who's being held imprisoned abroad, that, um, that time, whether it's, you know, an hour, a day, or a week, matters to people, right? And I think that our response systems have to become much uh, more nimble uh, than they have been. And part of what we're doing here is to try and create that that, um, that, that lexicon or dictionary so that people know who they're supposed to call when a constituent gets, gets nabbed. And you know, one thing that, that we learned, disproportionate number of Americans being um, held hostage abroad by governments right now happen to be from Texas. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't understand why, uh, and, and, and we've heard from uh, families of several of them that Senator Ted Cruz has done absolutely nothing on this issue, won't even engage in conversations about it. 
he should be shamed for that, publicly shamed. Uh, you know, I, I put that on my list of things to do uh, in, in, in the months ahead, right? Because this is not a, an issue that, um, that can be forgotten about. Uh, I, I think it's fundamentally relevant to our ideas of citizenship and democracy. And, you know, I'm, uh, you're going to forgive me for, for being overly concerned about this particular issue uh, as a victim of, of state hostage taking. I'm going to be ringing the bell and, 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 and yelling about this until it's no longer a problem. And to, to just quickly add to that, Representative George um, also says in the film, um, you know, there should there isn't a member of Congress that doesn't care about bringing Americans home, but we have to make it a priority for them. Because so often, as you guys know, um, the priority is winning elections. Um, the priority, you know, different desks in the State Department have different priorities. Um, the National Security Council will have a different priority than the State Department. And so um, Iran, Venezuela, these are really easy bad guys to go after um, on television. And um, it's much easier for a member of Congress to rail against the, the boogeyman than to do the hard work to, to get a hostage home. They're afraid of being accused of working with Iran or working with Venezuela in order to get a person home. It's or appeasing just, them somehow. It's, it's more nuanced and, and complex than unfortunately many members of Congress are willing to you know, do. But for you guys who tried on this and got uh, dead ends at the State Department, it's all connected. I mean, unless the public gets it, they're not going to put pressure on Congress. Unless Congress gets it, they're not going to put pressure on the State Department, et cetera. So that's, you know, public education is a big part of this. Uh, Matt, how are we doing on time? I just well, we're, we're going to run. We're going to run out. But, you know, for our video and podcast listeners, they'll they'll not notice the difference. We're going to we're going to end somewhat abruptly for our radio listeners in, in about four minutes. But that's OK. Go ahead. So, uh, boy, there's there's so much to unpack when you start talking about what members of Congress uh, can do, should do and what how the public ought to be putting pressure Um you know, in in when when Ms. Zagari Radcliffe uh, was released, she pointed out uh, how many foreign secretaries does it take for someone to come home? Uh, a point that Jason, you made um, uh, and have made, there is existing U.S. law that could be brought to bear. And and Kate, both you and Jason uh, talked about the need for collaboration among effective. Uh, affected countries because a collaborative approach is needed. Right now, we're, you know, uh, Brittany Griner is being held in Russia. We're seeing sanctions against oligarchs and the Russian government. Um, in general, and, and right now, what should, what more should the U.S. government be doing? Kate, hey, you want to take it? You want me to go first? You can go. And then I want to make sure we tell people what they can do before radio runs. Yeah, Ab yeah right. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there, there are a, a couple of things that, that we aren't doing that we can't. One, um, global Magnitsky sanctions uh, that can go after the individuals who are involved in this. Um, hostage taking is considered uh, a form, an, an act of terror, right? And um, we have the ability to go after people, put travel bans on them, seize their assets abroad. Um, we're not using those Magnitsky sanctions as much as we should. Um, there are judgments. I hold a massive judgment against the government of Iran, along with dozens of other people who have been held hostage by Iran. We're on, on the verge of, you know, opening a, a new chapter with Iran um, and, you know, assets that, that, that are frozen around the world are going to be returned to Iran. Um, Take a chunk of those assets out to, to, to credit these judgments, and Iran will understand very quickly what the cost of taking hostage is. Um, and, and then I think, you know, this, this, this multinational approach, I want to say very quickly, I, I interviewed Jeremy Hunt uh, for, for some of the reporting we did on this, and he told me that when he went as foreign secretary to, to Iran to visit uh, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe back in 2018, the Swiss ambassador uh, held a dinner 
for other uh, ambassadors who all had citizens being held hostage in Iran. And Jeremy Hunt walked into the room and he said, this is when, when I understood this problem. I looked around and saw many ambassadors uh, with, with citizens being held at that very moment. And I had no idea. And I think it's, it's former uh, officials like yourself, like Jeremy Hunt and others who have seen this up close, seen the breakdown in it, that can really lead the charge in this public conversation in a way that sitting officials can't. And the, in the public conversation, people can join it by going to washingtonpost.com slash bring them home. And on that page, we have listed all of the Americans that are publicly um, identified as hostages overseas um, with links to their members of Congress or who's representing them that people can write to. And if you have to put in your zip code, just fake it, put in a local zip code and write to them and tell them that you care about this. Yeah. And also we put a tweet button that says POTUS bring these people home. It's simple, but until the public starts talking about this, elected people, and unless there is, you know, thoughtful as you guys, they're not going to make it a priority. So Washington Post slash bring them home. It's free. Um, you have to put your email in. This sounds like a begathon, but um, we really do want people to engage with it because um, otherwise nothing will change. Well, you know, we want that too. And that's exactly why we're, we're really so thrilled to have the both of you on the show with us. And I, I would just commend your last point there, Kate, to people. Uh, look, I, I, this used to be when I started out on Capitol Hill, this was one of my jobs. I, I helped deal with incoming constituent correspondents, members of Congress, do pay attention to this kind of thing. So the film is Bring Them Home. I hope people will check that out. You could also share this podcast discussion with people, with your friends. We do want to get the word around and we want to bring attention to these situations, particularly the family of Ahmad Shargi. And I, I want to thank both of you, uh, Jason and Kate, for joining us on Beyond Politics. Oh my Thanks, gosh, this man. has been such a thoughtful conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, Paul. We really appreciate it. You bet. And I will add for the podcast listeners, um, is that okay? Um, please, please. Okay, so one of the special things about this reporting, I think, is that um, we worked with the Pulitzer Center to create educational curriculum about this issue. So um, in order for kids to understand really complex, sometimes scary issues, and for teachers who are trying to explain a very rapidly changing world where there aren't international norms and laws being followed as much. Um, we have a viewing guide and curriculum for K through 12 students that meet the common core standards. And um, teachers can use this to, to um, talk about family separation and other issues. So it's on, it's on the site too. And I think, um, you know, if we're trying to make a a more thoughtful society and community, um, empathy, I think is a big part of it. We're gonna make sure to put that link as well uh, to those materials into the show notes. And look, since we're bleeding over here by a couple of minutes, we've, lo we've left our radio listeners far behind, but uh, for the folks sticking out on podcast, I did wanna to get to just one more question because I think, Kate, what you were just saying about a little, a little bit of hope Mm -hmm. in this, that there's light at the end of the tunnel is incredibly important. It's incredibly important for, this is what basically Amnesty International has been doing for 50 years, is mm -hmm. trying to provide hope for people who have none, particularly if they're in solitary confinement. And, you know, J Jason, not to put you on the spot, but could you maybe just for a moment, give our, our listeners and our viewers a sense of the feeling that maybe Nazanin Zagari Radcliffe maybe experiencing right now and yeah. that maybe you experienced and that hopefully Ahmad Sharkey is going to experience in the near future when Look, you get out. It, it is the, the moment of um, pure joy and um, relief. Uh, after 544 days, I felt as though um, my, uh, my shoulders finally kind of loosened. Hmm. And um that's not to say that there weren't new challenges ahead of me. There, you know, putting your life back together um, is not easy, uh, but it's possible. 
there's no guarantee that, it, that you're going to heal, but, but the possibility is there. Um, but all of a sudden you come out and things are up to you again. And, you know, where you go, who you see, what you talk about, what you do, it's in your hands. Um, and, and for me, you know, doing this kind of reporting uh, has made me feel like um, that 544 days wasn't just, you know, lost, right? Um, I learned something, I experienced something that very few others can relate to. Um, and I'm going to use that knowledge and experience to try and uh, educate others and help other families who are going through this um, until the time that this is no longer a problem. Man, thank you both so much for the hard work and your courage and your openness, um, because what you're doing is so, so important. And uh, it's really an honor to have you both on the show. Oh my gosh, Thank you for I caring. really feel the same. You. I'm so yeah. I'm grateful that you guys have created the space um, and that your your audiences have access to nuanced conversations. So way to work. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. See you in May. All right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap the show. And uh, Jason, happy birthday! You and I share a birthday. Oh I'm, wow! Uh, oh, happy birthday to you. Nice. I'm very. Uh, I I I gotta say I I I do try to keep in mind. Um, yeah, my father was an overseas reporter and he was briefly captured by Idi Amin, um, which, and so I, I, I just have a special place in my mind for, especially for journalists who are, who are held hostage overseas. So I was, I was really delighted when you got out. It's, it's great to see you.